Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Strong and Capable podcast. This is your host, Bridget Heller, and I have on my good friend, as always. I love having my friends on the podcast, <laughs> Katie Hastings. Katie, you want to say hey? Hi, thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you. We're starting off, it's Mental Health Awareness Month, and Katie is an author, brand new author in the author scene. And she reached out to me and she said, hey, I think we should talk about this. And I said, hey, Mental Health Month is coming, let's do it. So Katie Hastings is a pediatric nurse. She's the author of children's book, Your Safe Body. She's a mother, a wife, a child abuse survivor, and creator of SHOUT. SHOUT is a body safety acronym taught in her book, to help parents educate and prevent sexual abuse in children. Katie is my hero because she lives in Hawaii and it's beautiful there and they do all of the things in Hawaii, <laughs> all of the things. So she lives in Oahu with her husband and her, did I say that right? Yeah, and her four sons and she's the founder and owner of the company Shout, which is dedicated to abuse prevention. She loves getting outside, watching her boys participate in sporting activities and a good book, family, friends, travel. I watch her do all these things <laughs> Katie is amazing, and I think you guys are going to love her. Katie, let's talk a little bit about your book as far as what led you to this. How did you get here? What what was the journey to creating sure. this whole company and book? Sure. So really, it came from, you know, I, I waited to report child abuse um, that I endured. You talked about me being a survivor. I waited, and I went through that experience of reporting and trial and everything just it just closed like the last year and a half got. Mm -hmm. So I was going through that process, right? It takes some time for about two to three years. And when you're, when I was going through that and going back through like my experience um, and other victims that were involved, I just started seeing this major gap in body safety education. And it was like, okay, like what I wish I would have known based also on science, based also on the fact of like taking care of pediatric patients who had been through that and and so that's kind of what was the drive behind creating the book right was like okay we have a major gap and we need something that we can give to parents and kids healthcare providers teachers that can just help kids and so in the book um they learn an acronym shout mm -hmm. and um shout stands for stop help out unsafe and tell and i just wanted this really simple tool that kids could take to learn to self-advocate um, kind of like, do you remember learning like PEMDAS or I before E except after C, these mm -hmm. little things we learned in elementary? Okay, so that's kind of where this came from. It was like, these are things we still remember now as adults that we learned in elementary school and they're ordinal concepts and like PEMDAS is like, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. And it's like, you sit and you do a math test and you know what to start with first, parentheses, right? For the P and you go through. So it's kind of like, that's what I wanted. I wanted a tool kids could take to be like, um, know what to do when we're not there with them. Like we can't be there on a math test and procedural ordinal step to know what to do if they find themselves in an unsafe situation. So that's kind of where it came from, shout and everything and um, and the drive behind the book. So I love that. Can you say that again? What does shout stand for? Um, so shout stands for stop, help, out, and safe, and tell. And the book like goes through it in more detail, like the kids get a breakdown of like what stop would look like and stop mm -hmm. kind of goes through um, keeping private parts personal and when you would say stop, you know, and then help looks like knowing they need to get help or they can say help. Oh, looks like getting out of any unsafe situation and not going back to the same place with the same person. Unsafe looks like um, recognizing unsafe if it's it doesn't need to just be an adult, right? It can be a peer, it can be a boyfriend, a girlfriend, another child, anyone who's being unsafe. And T, tell is like reminding them to tell somebody they can't get help if they don't tell and they're not in trouble when they tell, kind of broken down, condensed a little bit. I think telling is the biggest one because if you're um, a survivor of abuse, there's a lot of shame that comes with that, right? Absolutely. You don't know what to do and you feel like maybe you did something wrong. And a lot of times the the predator makes you feel like you've done something wrong. Absolutely. It's definitely, so, I mean, we're talking about mental health. It's, it's the way the child's brain will think children who are victims of sexual abuse. A lot of the times the abuser is someone they know. So it comes with shame, like you said, and then it comes with confusion, embarrassment, 
betrayal and they're afraid to get in trouble. They don't know what to do, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that that leads to a lot of children not telling. Um, I know that played a big role for me, kind of like you said, for you. And so it just kind of helps them learn like, hey, I got to tell, I can't get help if I don't tell. And then it keeps from repeating uh, abuse because usually it's repetitive. Um, and so it'll stop that repetitive recurring cyclic abuse from happening. Mm -hmm. And I think that's usually when a child does tell is when they're finally to the point where they can't stand it anymore. That has right. to stop. And, right. and I love the idea of your book because we have to have tools to talk about hard things. Right. And this doesn't, and I've also learned hard things are only hard when we make them hard. If we talk about them, then they're sure. not so hard anymore. Right. Sure. Um, just like, you know, I remember my poor daughter, but I remember when she started her period and all that on hormones, like it's awkward and hard unless you make it not awkward and hard. Sure. So well, the more we talked about it, the more I could see this wasn't a big deal, but at first it was to her. Right. And so I feel like these things in so much in our culture, the things we don't talk about, um, having a miscarriage was another one. That's a taboo. You don't talk about right. it. And so then it's more hard to go through because nobody talks about it. That's again, getting better. And I feel like this is another one of those. It's been taboo to talk about, but there are so many victims, so many victims out there that it shouldn't be taboo. It needs to be, how can we help people? And like you said, talking about mental health, shame rewires our brain. And right. so when you have shame, there are long long consequences for that way into our adult life our teenage life and I think it's really important to be able to tell someone so I, I think tell like I'm like yes tell that's a big one no, absolutely yeah and I just think in my own personal experience it was just kind of like a power through right and you can only like power through something like you said not telling not addressing for so long and that's what we're seeing is the effects of mental health on um, abuse survivors, because that number is so high. It's like one in five before 18 children are sexually abused. It's so high. And so um, I think that children have an ability to power through and push through, but it's always going to catch up to you once you're able to actually address what's fueling that, that situation, that behavior. The healing can't take place until there's awareness and recognition of what's happened and taken place so yeah yeah it really it really can't so you wrote this book you said you went on your own journey and you wrote this book and what are your goals long term with the show what does that look like how is this gonna I'm excited to hear <laughs> oh well basically in a nutshell what I want is I want shout to become a household saying for body safety I want people to say, see shout and know that it's connected to body safety and that they've heard about it. Maybe they can't remember exactly what it stands for, but they'll see it like you could see something like dare. And we all know mm -hmm. it has something to do with drugs. Some of us know exactly what it stands for, but I, that's what really my goal is. I just want it to get into homes. I want it to get spread. I want people to be able to be like, oh, you know, I taught my kids shout, like when they're having a little conversation with another parent about how to teach body safety and that's my overall goal is I just want that word out and where people know what it stands for because it's it's really it's a free personal tool we can give kids to self-advocate you know so that's my yeah so how do you talk about it in your own house I know you have boys so how do how do you guys talk about this what does the conversation look about? like this yeah I mean and that's kind of I wrote the book based on conversations I'd have with them right but um no, I mean, they actually told their teacher at school yesterday about the book because they were like in a little news article. I didn't know. They come home and they're like, we told our teacher about shout and, you know, that you've got to say stop and shout out and help. And, you know, they were going through it all. And I was like, oh, you did? And again, like, yeah. then we Googled it. We found it and we talked about it in class. And so that like made me so happy, like that the kids were like spreading that. But yeah, I mean, one of the boys picked up the book the other day and of course they're reading it and it's all serious and giggles since you start talking about private parts and the names of private parts, right? And they're giggling, and, but they're saying the names because like you said, like it can be taboo, but it's just like children need to know 
their fingers, their hands, their elbows, their wrists, their shoulders. So if they fall down and get hurt, they can be like, hey, you know, this part of me hurts. They need to know all the anatomical names of private parts um, so that there's no question of if someone were abused coming to you. And that plays such a big role in holding um, abusers accountable too. Because when children are referring to a private part as something like a peepee, you know, that it's, it's we, we sugarcoat these things, like it's very confusing for the jurors or judge or anyone to be able to like rightfully say, this is what happened. There's no confusion. And also there's no confusion to parents in that tell part of like coming and saying, this is what happened. And so anyhow, but those body safety talks, um, definitely I wrote the book based on reading it to my own children and seeing what worked and what didn't work. And it's 28 pages, but it's short. You know, it's a few sentences on each page so it can hold the child's attention span. Um, and anyway, so that's kind of what those talks look like and that we have these frequent brushing up and asking them, what does SHOUT stand for again? Um, it's reminding them when they go off somewhere like on an overnight field trip or a summer camp or whatever that looks like. It's a really easy tool for me to go back. Like we've already had this discussion and we've read the book. We've had body safety talks at home and it's like, hey, remember SHOUT, right? And they'll just kind of, yeah, mom, and, and repeat it back to me. And that's kind of how we've done it in our home. And then just always um, reminding them too, like to make sure they're being safe too. Like we don't wanna just even just joke around at all with private parts if it has to do with, they also need to be responsible too for not doing anything unsafe to anybody else. Cause that's a big part of like peer to peer abuse that we're having these days. I think that comes from like desensitization and media and screens and they're having cell phones a lot younger these age, but it is a big problem that's on a rise in our community too. Yeah, and I, that's what I was thinking is all these things you're teaching directly translate to when they get older and the conversations you have about social media and texting and YouTube and, and TikTok and all the things, right? All the things. Yeah. Because Did you see that article the FBI came out with that said there's 500,000 active online pedophiles a day now, which is what you talked about online, like because they'll pose like a child, right? And then they'll make this relationship with the child. And then that's where we have a lot more, that number's constantly um, changing from 80 to 93% of child abusers knowing their abuser. But even online now, they're showing that they know that abuser in some sense of form, they've maybe met them before. It can still be a stranger, but they have maybe met somebody through a friend, through a sports, through a teacher, whatever. And then they create this relationship online with them. And then that's where you lead to the child exploitation. It's usually asking for images of that child naked, which are sent and then redistributed. And then they kind of blackmail and this and that. But I mean, it's everywhere. So it's just having those discussions too with them. I'm always very clear, like, hey, if anyone ever wanted you to take a picture of their private parts or ask for a picture of your private parts, like we just don't do that. And, and also teaching, like, you know, we don't, we can't ever get things back that we send out. They might mm -hmm. think it's private. That's usually how it's usually there hasn't been some sort of body safety discussion in the home. So the child thinks it's just between them and whoever this friend that they now think that they trust online, whereas that image is distributed largely on the black web, you know? So anyway, and then too, like shout, um, we've, we've taught that it can be used with like, like you said, internet safety, pornography, whatever, it kind of works, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my goal there. Yeah, the principle, the principles are the same. I mean, I think about my, I have, my son has a Snapchat, right? And he has this streak with this girl. He's never met her. He's uh -huh. never met her. And it's the longest streak he has of any of them. And that's important to him. You know, how long is he? So his aunt and him Snapchat every day. And she's all, it's cute. I'll be with my sister and she'll be like, oh, I got a Snapchat, Jack. We have our streak going, <laughs> you know, like that's important to him. But this girl he's never met. And that really, highlighted for me how scary I mean I already know how scary it is I've taken a lot of classes and stuff like I think all of us moms are some somewhat aware but it can happen at any time at any moment to any child they can have a relationship and then like you said it's exploited and that is that is scary and I know as far as women like I wrote down the stat here somewhere I'll pull it up 30 to 60 percent of women with mental health issues have suffered from abuse so they're still really learning the connection of abuse and mental health because there's so much that goes into genetics, right? There's 
that are mental health, there's genetics and there's trauma and there's abuse and all these things. So they're really, that was what's surprising to me when I started researching it before this call was that there isn't really firm understanding of the relationship, only that it exists and it's very bad sure. as far as abuse and mental health. And I thought, wow, but I can tell you working with the groups of women I do, when we get real, real in our groups, it's shocking that almost every person in the room, like you said, one in five children. So then you, you bring that to a 500 person class, a hundred of those people, you know, have been abused. And most of them are getting, becoming open about it because you can only go so long. Like you said at the beginning, you can only go so long and our children don't need to suffer like that from now until their adult years, if they have the education when they're early in the conversations early, they can avoid so much of it. So I really love what you're doing. I think it's good. Well, thank you. Well, I think that's the point you brought up too, just about that shame and telling, like, I think that's probably so largely correlated if we were able to actually study that. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be interested to see if anybody has, I don't think I've seen any studies on that, but I bet if we did break that down and you put in the telling part correlated to mental health issues, I bet that correlation, I would guess, would be very strong. And the response to it, that's something, let me write your next book for you, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> the Parent's Guide to Shout. Oh, yes. Yes, what <laughs> like, to do, right? Yes, as a parent, you know, when your kid comes to you and says, this is what's happened, when they finally, it takes everything in them to come and tell, right? Absolutely. How do you respond? What does How that do look respond? like? You know, I just did, um, I'm working on a collaboration with a few other ones that, one's Jot Journal, she asked me to help with this. And I just recorded and put up like this little talk because like you said, everybody's like, shout's great, but Katie, what do we do if our child's been sexually abused? It's always the next question. So I just kind of went over that, but you know, that also has to do with shame also, but in the role of parents and despair, mm -hmm. like like when, when the child's coming to you, again, that statistic is 80 to 93%, whether it's online or in-person physical sexual abuse with the child, there's somebody that the child knows. And so it can be really hard. That also correlates then that it's somebody you know as a parent, okay? And so it can be really hard to want to believe that. And like you said, when a child's finally coming to you, it's just they're usually giving you the tip of the iceberg of what's taken place and it's taken a ton of courage for them to come in the first place. And then when you've taught your child the proper anatomical terms, then there's no question in your mind of what took place, you know, for whoever the abuser is and their anatomical terms, your child's anatomical terms and what happened. And so then the, that confusion can be taken out. But the biggest thing is to not despair as a mom, like you as a, as a father, as a parent, a caregiver, because you can either take that and sometimes we, we are scared because we want to protect our kids, right? Or in, and then the other part of it is you might start shaming yourself in your head, like, oh, I'm a bad mom, I'm a bad dad, I can't believe this happened, and we can't do that. Like, we got to just stay calm and we got to be able to support the child. We got to reestablish safety, whatever that looks like. If they need to get uh, medical attention, if there's nurses and uh, physicians that are trained sexual assault nurse examiners. If the child needs to go to an emergency room to get some sort of exam and, um, you know, reestablishing safety and then getting them the support they need. We have so many wonderful resources now because we do talk about mental health and we do talk about sexual abuse. And since we do, there's so many more studies and therapies and treatments available to help whatever is beneficial for that child, you know? So it's not to despair, get them safety, get the support they need, trust the child, support them at all costs. Um, and that's my best advice. I love that. And I love, especially, like you said, there's a whole ego pride weirdness, like thing that plays into your emotions of you know, what, where's my role in this as a parent? What's my fault? What's not? And I think that's a whole journey to take, but I love mostly what you said about safety, reestablishing safety for the child, because if you can, I think, especially the parent, if you can put aside yourself in, sure. the, in the moment and focus on, okay, what do I have to do to create safety again within my home, for my child, with when, whatever environment this happened in, what does safety look like? Let's work on that. And then we can come back to all the other things. Sure. 
you know, and work through those. But I'm a huge fan, as a lot of my listeners know, of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And that first one is safety, feeling safe. And if you don't feel safe, you can't thrive in any other way. So I really, really love love that. That's cool. Absolutely. Well, I love what you said, too, because if we don't feel safe, we're going to be anxious. And that's going to lead to mental health challenges. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's everything. Yeah, it just snowballs. If you don't feel safe, everything snowballs, right? Like you said, if you don't feel safe, then you get anxious. Then you're anxious. Now you're looking over your shoulder all the time, whether it's at school or family parties or church events or whatever you're doing in your life with the grocery store. Now everything's suffering. Maybe you didn't notice the things you should have noticed to continue to keep you safe. Maybe your grades start falling. Maybe you stop eating. Now everything else is suffering, right? Our social life starts suffering. And so it it snowballs into a very unhealthy place. Whereas if you can just reestablish safety, you can keep going. No, absolutely. I love that. I love very that. Very cool. Okay. So where can people find you? Where can parents find your book and interact with you? What do you have to offer moving forward? You got the book. I, be- I think you said you had a program coming out, right? Oh, yes. Okay. So you can find me. Instagram is probably the best because the book's linked there. That's, mm-hmm. um, my name is Katie, the mom, the nurse there. And I share like helpful information information for like trauma, abuse, prevention, my books there. Um, the book is available at like Amazon, Barnes and Noble and greater retailers, but it's also linked. And yes, and I'm working on um, like a victim healing kit. Like it's, I wanted to focus on the five senses because it's something that a majority of everybody has. Some of us have disabilities that don't have all five senses, but a majority have the five senses and it's something that's free and available to us. And it's something that's really helped me in my healing has been just focusing on the things that are going on around me. And I've also noticed that those can be triggers for me, the same five senses and learning how to like go back through, like you said, that safety of of a safe connection of something like a smell or a sight or a touch, you know, something that when you're triggered in an unsafe situation to go back through to a safe um, sensory. And so anyway, this is what I'm working on. And, and I was wanted it to specifically be on the five senses because it, for most of us, we have all five senses and can work on that. And it's something that's free to us and that we can work on, on our own, like a DIY kind of thing, mm-hmm. self-help, so. I love that. I know when I was having massive panic attacks a few years ago, I was in counseling. My counselor had me put together a kit like that. It's like, what's well, something you can okay. smell? What's something we can touch? Yeah, we, that's we awesome. Like that. she, and I just had it in my purse. It was like a tiny bag of stuff. And just get yourself a cute bag from Target. This doesn't have to be embarrassing or weird. Yeah. You know, but you get a lip balm that feels good, but has a scent to it, like lavender or something, uh-huh. you know, and then you're hitting two senses. We feel and we smell. So it was very helpful to me. Just get some lotion because you're putting on lotion. That's not weird, but you know that you're helping your body reset. I love that. I love yeah. that. And just bringing yeah. awareness back to your safety and yourself, like you said. So that's mm-hmm. so cool. Very awesome. Well, we'll be on the look for that. And then you said it's Katie the mom, the nurse at Instagram. Yes. Uh huh. Okay. So everyone go check out Katie and I know you can get her book on Amazon because I saw that, right? Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. I'm like, right. I'm not crazy. I saw it on Amazon. Yeah. It's on Amazon. <laughs> yes. So you can go to Instagram and get it or get it on Amazon. And I am so glad you're doing this because I know if, as a child, I had had these conversations. It would have changed a lot for me, but I also love that you're giving tools for parents now because my kids had grown up and we didn't have these tools. And I was just like fumbling around knowing as a victim that I needed to talk to my kids about it, but not really knowing how. So I really, really love the gap. Like you said that you're filling. Thank you, Katie. Thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me.